Hmm. Sorry, this is the third attempt of the stream. Just somehow managed to completely um, crash OBS. Do apologise. I better wait for everyone to come back up. Uh, whilst I'm waiting, I'm just going to look at the memory. Um, folks uh, some of you are jumping are you back Laurie as well before I answer your question so the question Laurie was asking me was is it possible to do uh, an SD RAM mezzanine board Um, yeah, so Laurie, you can see what I'm doing. Trouble is, I can't see if you're actually connected there. That's why I ask. So, the answer to the question is, can we, could we, if we wished, make an SD uh, RAM mezzanine? The answer is, yes, we can. So with those 37 pins that we'd use for SRAM, um, which is formed from the mezzanine and, you know, tile-free, if you like, uh, we could do a similar thing and put SD RAM uh, on there. Uh, in terms of capacity, I think that would give us a. Um, I think it would be a four megabyte. Hold on. What size would it be? I think it would be four megabytes of SD RAM would be the max that we could do. Um, I'm just trying to think, so on the MX we had 16 megabit, which was two megabytes of SD RAM uh, with an internal bank. With the, that takes 36 pins, I think, if I remember rightly, hold on. 20, that takes 36 pins and we've effectively for this one we've got effectively 37 so we would be able to do uh, add another line to that so we'd have two banks which would give us um, 32 megabits which would be uh, 4 megabytes to answer your question Laurie it is possible but the amount of memory we'd have would be less than if we go down the hyper RAM route because at the moment we've got a 64 megabit hyper flash and that uh, that gives us 8 megabytes so we've got twice what we'd have with SD RAM and we're using a lot fewer pins now Let's look at the performance comparison with SD RAM. Um, you've probably got a lower latency than you have with Hyperflash. Now, the Hyperflash, let's assume we can run that at 100 megahertz, right? 
it's an 8-bit interface and it's DDR so effectively we're running at 200 megabytes per second if it's performant that's kind of what we're hoping to get to right with the hyper RAM 200 megabytes per second um, the SRAM will be similar it's got a 16-bit data interface uh, 10 nanoseconds access time which means 100 mega set mega megabytes per sec 100 100 words per second the word length is two meg two two bytes so it's 200 megabytes per second so it's similar in terms of transfer rate but it's consistent there are no pauses for the DRAM up uh, the DRAM re internal refreshes and all the complex state machine that goes with that um, with the SD RAM, I'm not sure what speed we could run it at. I think I don't think anyone on the MX has ever run the SD RAM beyond 100 megahertz. So, performance-wise, it's going to be very similar, on average, compared to the Hyper RAM, but the pauses for the refresh, etc. Um, will pose a lower penalty than you do having to go through the hyper flash state machine. Um, so there would be a marginal benefit but half the capacity I think Laurie. That would be my executive summary. Um, Laurie's saying we know the SD RAM can emulate SRAM well enough for retro computers but we are pretty sure Hyper RAM cannot um, I guess that's true I mean, we haven't tried it, but certainly the conversations with um, Salvan, etc., seem to indicate um, HyperRAM's non ideal performance for retro. Um, but then again, we're not using that type of memory for retro, um, we're going down the SRAM route. For retro so in balance if we're looking say we had a choice right say we had SRAM as a choice and that was fixed then the other choice was or well, do we offer just hyper RAM or just ST RAM okay so if you if you have that choice which one would you choose now you may get slightly better performance with the SD RAM but you're going to use up not only all of the mezzanine connectors but you're also going to use up that extra tile as well so your solution is less flexible and you only get half the capacity interesting so what Laurie's saying here is so SD RAM is good for retro computers that need more memory than SRAM can provide. I would choose SRAM and Hyper RAM. Just good to see that SD RAM is a possibility. I mean, it would be entirely possible to offer free, however. I'm concerned for the layers of complexity that we're, that we're adding and the support that we'd have to provide and the HDL that we'd have to create in order to even make these uh, work. We could maybe consider it later on.
I'll let that settle in anyhow. You may want to come back round to that. But I, I mean, that was kind of my thinking when I thought about the SD RAM before is, are we really adding much value compared to Hyper RAM if we've got an SRAM solution that is an excellent solution for the retro things? So in that sense, you know, if there was a priority, I was thinking um, SRAM and Hyper RAM would be a first choice. Um, SD RAM would be probably further down the list in my choices. However, there is one other thought, one other possibility. Um, although I'm not not sold on this. Say you did SRAM and you did something similar with SD RAM in terms of the mezzanine tile combination because you'd need all the pins to do it. You can still offer hyper RAM because hyper RAM will fit on a tile. However, there is an issue. Uh, it's a bandwidth issue. Getting good performance from hyper RAM requires being picky about which pins you connect and also being careful about the routing of the lines. Uh, in particular the data and the DQS lines and the clock. Um, and we are doing that with the mezzanine. You know, it's, it's, you know, Sylvan and I talked at length and he advised me the best IO configuration to get decent performance from it. If it's on the tile, we don't really get that luxury because you can put it on any tile. Um, so it's going to be slightly more compromised in terms of performance. But it's just another way of looking it to put in, you know, throwing it in the in the wing as a uh, as a worth thinking about, perhaps. Um, but certainly, for me looking at it uh, before. I think I looked at it last week sometime. I revisited it. To me, the two, you know, primary candidates for me were SRAM and and Hyper RAM. But it's good to throw it out there and get people's uh, people's thoughts on it. Um, Yeah, I think um, what's that covered? And my tea's out. So, coming back round to the. Let me just get a drink of water. Let's look at the retro um, and the SRAM. Uh, be great if we can think of another name. I'm not sure I want to call it retro, but um, there is a naming thing going on here that we may come back round to. But um, so if we have the SRAM, what we were, what what I looked at is going for a uh, 500 and 512 KB, which is formed of a uh, um, what was it? Yeah, two fifty six. Oh, hold on, my keyboard's in a funny mode here. Two fifty six uh, K bytes. That is by uh, sixteen, which provides effectively. Uh, 512 KB okay and if we can if it's it's 10 nanoseconds so that's the one I'm looking at it's 10 nanoseconds I'm looking at something that's very similar to what we used before um, it's a lot more expensive actually than the 45 nanosecond ones 
uh, probably twice the price. But right, even though you might not need it in the retro type applications, uh, it actually serves as a really good fast platform in applications where you don't need much memory with the FPGA and it's nice and simple. So a 10 nanosecond would give us, you know, uh, 100 mega, megahertz 16-bit um, access or 200 megabytes per second without all the nasty interruptions that you get with things like SD card or the complexity of the state machines and stuff that were involved in that or similar with um, the even more complex, the, uh, the Hyper RAM. So that is the amount I was looking at. Uh, and I think we kind of came to the conclusion that that was probably the uh, best way of going uh, in the conversations. Uh, there was a sacrifice there in that uh, we needed the UART pins, which takes me on to the second part of that conversation because um, that meant what we were going to do is we'd have to run the UART over QS, QSPY. QSPY, for those uh, that may have missed some of the early stuff, is, is basically it's a quad SPI link between the, it's the umbilical link between the STM32 and the FPGA. Um, we can use, you know, small packets over a very fast, um, nibble connection effectively now um, the things that we could run over this so the obvious one I've just mentioned is we run our uh, UART over that uh, the advantage of running the UART over that is it actually makes the HDL for the UART theoretically simpler because it doesn't have to worry about um, bowel rates and that kind of stuff and there's plenty of bandwidth there. Um, and then at the other end, the STM32 still chucks it up the UART, uh, you know, as a normal uh, USB CDC COM serial. So from the host end, it looks the same. Um, Spell it right, isn't it? So that's one of the one of the peripherals we could buffer over QSPY. Um, let's talk about the other things that we were interested in doing. We wanted to. Oh, yes. Let's talk about this one. Laurie brought this up today. The um, when you're doing the retro stuff, for example, you need access to. Uh, ROM images and disk images and stuff so having access to kind of a virtual disk is um, is a pretty good idea so normally we used like the SD card um, to load and store stuff just using an SD card for example you can use flash if it's small but if you've got a series of different uh, uh, images on there you might want something larger I mean, you could store some of these in Hyper RAM as well, by the way. Sorry, Hyper Flash, if you so wished. Uh, sorry, not Hyper Flash. Um, in the Spy Flash. Uh, do, 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 do. This was, uh, I think I was going to put this, let's just put it down as SD card. Uh, for now. Because um, I guess these will be virtual commands. So what uh, Laurie said earlier was that he'd been looking at and working on uh, virtual disk commands. Uh, I think you're working on the ULX3. Hold on. Um,
Uh, so Laurie was just saying getting 100 megahertz access from the SRAM makes the HDO harder. You have to follow Tom Verview's examples to configure the I.O. pads. Okay, it's a long time since I looked at that. I will take a look at that. Uh, I wonder if he's doing the 8 to 16 thing there. Possibly. Um, so the SD card, Laurie, you were, you were talking about, what did you say? Hold on. You said, um, I'm currently trying to get the version of Mr. Floppy Disk Code working on the ULX3 for the Amstrad CPC. It uses a remote SD card interface, uh, which I'm beginning to understand a bit better. It looks different. It looks as if doing this over QSPY or, or doing a QSPY version of that for ILD would not be too hard. And we would not need to buffer the whole flippy, floppy image in RAM. Yeah, because we want to try and avoid that. I mean, you can have buffers each side if you need to, but you don't really want um, to start putting your um, this stuff in Flash if you can avoid it. Because speed points, you probably don't need it, certainly for retro stuff. Um, this is the Mr. Interface Report SD card access, and there's a link there. See virtual hard drives and block devices. So you, you send some of that data over a QSPY and stream the data back from the card. So I think that's definitely. Uh, by candidate. Um, my post is saying, what about the idea of extra LEDs, possibly? Uh, that's not to do with QSPY, is it? That's just, is that separate? And let me just make it a list and we can come back round to that. Um, my post. Come back to that. Sec. So, uh, what else did we have on the list for QSPY? One of the things I was thinking of possible is an audio uh, interface. So it's the STM32 handled the audio IO, whether that's digital or analog, then there'd be a, a digital buffer over QSPY for the audio. That would make the implementing the audio uh, on the HDL side uh, a little easier. Uh, I'm not sure on the audio device at this point. Um, the STM32 does have very sophisticated I2S SPDIF uh, and I've already freed up the pins to be able to use that if we want to use that uh, so we can use that in the uh, retro example if we so wish and maybe just combine that with a codec that also has analog uh, output for a speaker or something so that's a possibility not quite sure how that would look from the um, HDL size. With audio, you get problems with things like jitter and that, don't you? So I'm not sure if that would create an issue. Most of the retro stuff uses very low bandwidth audio, frankly. You know, it's not high bandwidth stuff, so that's less of an issue. 
and all of the retro stuff had completely different audio implementations um, by virtualizing and standardizing that we might be able to um, make the HDL a bit simpler possibly I don't know what you guys think of that Laurie you probably know more about this than me you've probably seen what's been um, uh, what's been done on the audio side for the retro implementations um, anything else that would go over QSPY Um, what do we got? So, you are SD card audio interface. So, disk interface, audio interface, and you aren't. I think most other things would probably be better off handled directly by the FPGA using tiles. Obviously VGA, HDMI, that kind of stuff, that's just just a tile. Or an LCD display, that's another tile. Norris says I think it would usually be easiest to do the audio on the FPGA side. But high quality audio via the STM32 is a possibility. Well, you've always got a choice. If we can provide a facility that works over QSPY, it's there. Uh, if you want to go uh, more authentic, uh, then you can add the authentic audio particulars onto a tire, I guess. Um, but what is authentic audio in the retro world is a bit tricky because they had all sorts of wacky stuff um, is my understanding it definitely wasn't standardized it was all fairly unique oh the, I know what else we have to cover here um, some sort of uh, video text overlay yeah somehow we'd need to something here and what was I saying I to s and under Uh, we can probably do SP diff as well. We'd have to look at how much room we had for the connectors. Basically, these connectors could go on the tile side of the mezzanine, but they'd have to be low profile ones currently because we don't have the cutout on that tile. Unless we added the cutout in, which is possible.
Um, the other thing is, I think uh, the F7 has some good, like, um, anti alias and diver filtering and that kind of stuff, which is kind of handy on the audio side. What is the video GUI option? Um, okay, so the video GUI text overlay. So, uh, hold on. Hold on, let's just finish with the audio stuff and we'll come back to that I post. Laurie's saying there are implementations of various retro chips which usually outputs a sample of specific width, say 10 bits. If you have a one bit output, that needs to use PDM, etc. So an alternative is to send the sample to the STM32 if you can avoid the jitter. And I think um, at 10 bits you can. You probably wouldn't notice the jitter, frankly. But I'd need to just go through that head. I, I don't do a lot of audio. It's not my expertise. I know that jitter can be a problem but with such a low resolution it probably wouldn't be because the amount of information you're moving is low low bit depth and probably low sample rate effectively so there's a lot of uh, flexibility in there to avoid jitter um, back to the video thanks Lauren for that um, the video GUI text overlay. Oh, Laurie can talk about this at length. If you were to look at the um, Mister, for example, what you get is, say you're playing, I don't know, say you're playing one game on there, like an NES game or something, and you want to load another game, then you have to provide some sort of menu type selection that overlays over the game. Or if you want to, you know, move to a different retro computer, maybe you want to go on and play around with your BBC retro, uh, then you need to be able to select that from a menu. So that stuff has to then go back. So there has to be an overlay over the display, and then there has to be a way of controlling what text is overlaid to the display, and that's selected so that the, you know, the choice can go back over QSPY or the choice is done internally in the HDL and it just becomes a direct disk access. There are different ways of doing it, really. I mean, would the STM32 if you had the virtualized disk, would the STM32 need to be involved in that? Or would this just be in... Uh, or would this just be an exercise that's handled on the HDL side? That's the question. You know, if, if, if the STM is just providing a virtual disk interface, then on the HDL side, you can list what's available in terms of um, game cartridges or emulation apps. you would need more functions in virtual disk to avoid OSD on screen display. Um, the Mr. one does not do directory listings. So it just gives access to a block device, did you say? Is that what it is? So it doesn't handle any disk um, 
formatting or any of that stuff. It's much more low level than that is what you're saying. So if it's that low level and that's what works over QSPY, then the STM32 does need to do some form of OSD. Um, and the STM32 obviously can easily handle, a, you know, like a fat file system or something on the SD card. It would need to be able to produce text which it sent over QSPY um, to generate menus and choices. Yeah, so what it's sending, Laurie, then is ASCII, right? And then something on the uh, HDL side will build a menu that it overlays over whatever the current video is being output. I mean, overlay shouldn't be that difficult in that many of the retro games aren't using all of the colours that may be available. So you could have an alpha channel if you like. And the alpha channel could be used to display the um, text just wondering does that take up extra video memory again this is where something like that seven seg um, font idea might be useful something that doesn't take up a heck of a lot of memory Overlaying the video with text isn't hard. I have Amaranth code for it. Yes, but does it take memory to do that? How do you convert the ASCII into the pixels that go out? Um, do you have to have like a local font that's stored somewhere in memory on the um, FPGA? Because again, that, that, that could take a portion of the memory away. The SRAM. Or the internal um, memory of the um, the ice forty, for example, could be using part of that sixteen k up. How how do you normally do it? So overlaying, um, Laurie's saying overlaying the video with text isn't hard. I have the Amaranth code for it on the ULX three. Uh, we use an eight sixteen grid font. But does that mean that you have to load the font as well? How how much memory does that take? What's the overhead? Because um, it all eats into that. It either eats into that 16K internal, the fast memory, really fast memory, or we start taking a chunk of SRAM. Um, but if you start taking a chunk of SRAM for this, then you kind of interfere with the, you know, the graphics or frame buffer interface that's running on the retro game at the time. And you want to try and avoid doing that where possible. I, I'm guessing. Sixteen bytes per character, about two hundred characters. So three hundred and twenty bytes. That's tiny. No, sixteen bytes per character, two hundred characters. So the font itself takes three hundred and twenty bytes, yeah? 
or thereabouts. Oh, 3,200 bytes. Yeah, sorry, my bad. 3.2K, which is substantial if that's got to go into, say, the 16K that takes a chunk out. Although you could say, if you were using that in the retro game, mind you, you probably wouldn't use that font in the retro game. You're only using it for the overlay in this case. They don't really need 200 characters. Maybe able to use an 8x8 font. Uh, that's what Laurie's saying. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, depending on the resolution of the screen, really. Um, We just got to be careful about the RAM usage, obviously. Anyhow, so it's definitely on the list, um, but we we'd need to look at you know. Push comes to shove, we could always go the seven seg route. To save a bit more memory, I say the alphanumeric segment rather than seven segment. Let's have a real retro look. Um, cool. Is there anything else that goes on this list? Anything else we have to squeeze across the Q spy? For retro purposes. I mean they're quite good if you look at them. You know, if you're using the SD card, you're not necessarily using the audio or video at the time, or the audio or video overlay much um, the audio is only being well if you're still running the game I guess I guess you would be hmm um, so I post is asking about LEDs or buttons maybe via an IO expander. Well, normally, I mean, are, are you thinking in the case of uh, retro? Because in the case of retro, those will be things like gaming controllers, a PS2 keyboard maybe, possibly. That was the other one. We'll come back to that. Yes, that was the other thing that we mentioned. Uh, USB PS to gamepad um, conversions. Forgot about that. So we have a choice. You could either have direct, you know, PS2 type, simple interfaces connected to the FPGA themselves. Those could exist on say, a tile. Or you could have those plug into the STM32. There is a spare USB that we could use to plug say a USB type device into it um, you could even do PS2 on the um, on the STM32 if you want and send commands that way uh, it's how far you take this and what you can do on the uh, STM32 
to offload you know what the FPGA needs to do um, whilst I'm dealing with You'll probably know this, um, sorry. These. Um, I'm not an expert on these things, but these are quite popular. I've got a couple of these, and those have the uh, kind of uh, nine pin. You can use like a nine pin D type at the other end of these to plug them in. But these, I can't remember what these use. Do they use PS2 or do they have their own just serial shift? And there's lots of different ones of these. And you can get the other ones with the USB connectors, but Tell me if I'm wrong, but the ones with the USB connectors, are they just running PS2 mode over USB or are they actually PS2? Um, as in PS2 over USB, like the old USB 1 PS2 emulation or whatever it was. I can't remember. You probably know more about that than me. Um, I mean we can always put that kind of thing on tiles the problem that you have with putting those on tiles is the amount of room each connector takes up because it's like um, it's the same size as a you know a VGA connector um, you know a nine pin connector it's the same size um, and obviously for a single tile that takes it all up unless you have it you know pointing vertically off the top rather coming out the side depends how many you need I guess you can have something that breaks out to two I, I should imagine there are a million and one different possibilities and ways of doing this Uh, Lloyd, they have their own serial protocol. The ones with the 9 pin connector use a Nintendo protocol. Esden did a pin mod for those. Um, yeah, so we could either go the P mod route for those, or you could even do it through the uh, STM32. I'm not sure how much you benefit you get by going through the STM32. other than saving yourself some tile space. I think the usefulness of the STM32 would be if it could do the um, USB and PS2 over USB type devices because we do have a USB uh, that runs you know on the STM32 although the host software is you know the host software that I've seen is very basic it can do a kind of keyboard HID device um, and it can only do one it can't deal with um, hubs and the like The USB ones have a HID report that varies between controllers. Mister has an interface to controllers that it sends to the FPGA 
So a bit like sending a HID report. But what is the interface that people plug into the Mr. part with? I seem to remember you showing me a whole bunch of like um, connector expansions and stuff like that. Mr. always uses USB host. Okay. So the controllers and stuff would all be USB based. Like USB HID devices or some such. And can it handle, um, presumably it can handle hubs and the like as well. Whereas we couldn't easily do that. we don't have that code you know for the uh, um so we could do single usb hosts potentially but going beyond that would be difficult on the stm32 frankly But it also has an interface that we looked at before that allow original controllers to be plugged in. I mean, you can have an external expander, an I.O. expander. So you could have a tile that had up to 12 I.O.s um, that went through a small, more compressed connector of some sort and then expanded out to, a, you know, a set of, um, you know, connectors you could you know on the ends of wires it's possible I think they were using like really weird things though weren't they um Laurie like HDMI connectors and stuff it was really bonkers I mean you can use like um if you use USB-C you've got You've got two D plus D minus connections that you normally connect together so that you can reverse it, right? Um, you've got the sideband channel, which is another two. You've also got the CC, but those tend to be pull up, pull downs. So, but you could theoretically do just using those pins. Um, you can do one, two, three, four, five, six, six. S you could do seven, eight. Depends whether you want to break the USB stand enough. You you could do, you could easily do six just using the D plus, D minus one and two plus the sideband. That would be six pins. How many game controllers is that? Do you need? Because there's like, you can common the. Do you common the clock? and divide the data I can't remember there are different schemes aren't there but yeah so if you had if you just stuck with those um, like uh, like that then you'd have quite a few um, channels yeah so interesting um, yeah so those are all USB A that adapts to a single gaming connector and what I was thinking of is having a USB-C that connected to multiple gaming connectors so on a tile you could have two USB-C's each with six conductors six IOs in them um, that could then in turn break out to uh, a whole number of gaming controllers that in fact would be overkill I would imagine
So there are different ways of doing that. It might be best on that front to use the FPGA to do that rather than the STM32. I mean, you could offer two um, USB host ports. But you wouldn't be able to support the USB part of that on the FPGA very easily. I mean, you, you uh, yeah, I've not seen any small host implementations on the FPGA side. The SNAC adapters don't use USB protocol, just USB connectors. It's confusing as Mr. has two ways of doing it. Yeah, USB that doesn't do USB is confusing. Um, what are you saying one way is USB host on its Linux system and then send the data to the FPGA yeah we don't have a Linux system mind you that would add some latency wouldn't it and I know how funny gamers are about their latencies when it comes to, um, you know, gaming keyboard control for their games. I mean, we do have one USB port that we could potentially use for that on the STM32 to do to convert one device, but not multiple devices. I think if we've got multiple devices, me, we'd need to look at. Um, possibly a tile although the USB C connector we've got because it's dual use because we're using it as power delivery um, we could connect something to the um, sideband which is two pins we can't use the CC pins because they're controlled by the um, USB controller. 
I'm not sure if we can use the uh, DP and D minus. If those were common, we'd have effectively four lines already on the USB connector. Well, two of them are connected. We could connect another two. Clearly, the lo it looks from the links that you've been sending on Discord that um, there are a number of ways that Mr. Solves the problem. Both on the uh, von Neumann side and on the um, FPGA side. I think we need to look at that more deeply and work out which way we're going to go because it's none obvious. So that's still a potential for QSPY, um, certainly from a USB point of view, but would there be any point in PS2 type stuff on the STM side or would you always want to do that on a tile? Even if the tile had it you know, expansions. The only other thing I was thinking here is I was going to say use the host, but that's not a good idea. It's going to be a lot of latency. So this one's uncertain. There's some potential here, but I think it's limited because because we don't have hub support and we'd only have one USB, there's a limit to what we could do. I mean, <clears throat> USB host for keyboard on STM32 selling PS2 to FPGA would support more modern keyboards than an FPGA inside a PS2 solution. So. Yeah, so if, it, if you were just using it for a keyboard, I think that makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, if you're using it for a game controller, uh, that's more difficult. And again, you it's only ever one. So it would only ever be in a one player scenario that that would be useful. Because you couldn't do multiple keyboards, right? Unless you turn the other USB port into another USB host and disabled the uh, the UART. So, in a retro situation where you're doing something like a BBC Micro, right? then that might be great because all you need to do is connect one keyboard, right? But if you're running a two person game and you need two game controllers, then it's not gonna cut it. Then you really need to move to some sort of tile that has more than one, you know, gaming connector on it or has an expansion port that breaks out to more than one. I think having the USB to a keyboard type thing is um, just a nice addition. It's not probably not necessarily. I mean, you've got it there by default then, I guess. So you don't have to add another tile in just to get the keyboard working with it. Um, 
I guess the other thing you can do is you can use your host's keyboard if what you're doing is effectively a terminal because that would be more than fast enough but for a game I'm not sure how well that would work because of latencies over the USB COM port Ooh. How are we doing for time? 21.17, we're doing good. Okay, so that's a possibility. The strongest argument for that is probably USB. Uh, two. To PS2. Uh, USB head uh, so it's via host isn't it Single, isn't it? Single. Beyond that, then it's a case of doing it on a tile that has some sort of expansion for gaming controllers. I, it's an add-on of some sort. You know, in, in that case, the STM32. There's no point in involving the STM32 because it's easier just to do it in the uh, FPGA, right? You're not gaining anything. <clears throat> Other than maybe saving some IOs. I think. I can see Laurie's typing. Um, is there anything else on the Q spike that we're missing, or can I consider this one um, complete? Got to get my directions right here. Not consistent.
Oh, don't do that. That's really, really annoying when it auto formats that. Um, actually. Leave it like that for the moment. Um, one other thing that uh, Laurie is suggesting that could go over QSPY is the I2C camera configuration. Um, if we don't have enough pins to do that from the FPGA. Okay, so if we do, if we did a uh, camera tile, all of the FPGA pins would connect to the camera tile with the exception of the I squared C, but each tile has I squared C. The I squared C that it has is connected to the STM32. So the STM32 does control the I squared C to the camera. So it wouldn't need to go over QSPY in that case. Because each tile has 12 IOs or up to 12 IOs. For the camera, you need uh, 8 data HV and you need the sinks and you need the pixel clock and you also need a clock for driving inside. So that uses up the 12 FPGA pins. The I squared C comes from the STM32 because that I squared C is rooted toward the tiles. In fact, there's two I squared C's uh, rooted to different tiles. That reduces the chance of address um, conflicts. needs to go over QSPY if the FPGA has the user interface. You have to sync the two sides. Why would the FPGA have the user interface? Um, I'll also mention that this doesn't apply in the ca in the retro situation anyhow. You have to sync both sides. There are lots of options for configuring the camera. My camera app had a button interface on the FPGA side. Possibly. However, it doesn't go under the retro mezzanine. Or does it? Because it's not just retro. It could be another app. So, let's just have a think about that so that we can rationalise it. So in this case, we're using, say, an FPGA camera, connected camera, and we've got SRAM, because we've got the retro mezzanine, or the SRAM mezzanine. Um, so it, 
SRAM is nice and fast for capturing of the camera, but it wouldn't capture much. Um, you could capture like a, a frame or two, depending on resolution. Trying to think of the scenarios where you'd be doing that. What would the application be where you'd be using a camera? Obviously not retro application. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine it, Laurie. What's the use case? I was kind of naturally assuming that we'd probably only be using cameras if we had, you know, more memory. A camera app or robotics app are use cases, even with that limited amount of memory. some sugar ones for thinking about this. Yeah, I guess in the case of using it for, say, robotics, we could be doing blob tracking, maybe, that object tracking, very simple color object tracking navigation uh, OpenMV often uses 320 by 240 yeah I'm just thinking what what resources you use up on the FPGA to process to frames. Um, it might be something that you want to get the STM32 involved in. Maybe you do some pre processing so the camera comes in low res, like you say, like a free 32240, pre processed by the FPGA into a um, what would you call it? Um, region of interest. Um, you then pass the coordinates to the STM32, for example, and then it and and the small image processed image. It can then maybe do the blob tracking rather than relying on the FPGA to do the su successive blob tracking. So you could distribute the processing effectively. Pre-processing done in FPGA to take the data rate down. And then, you know, the more higher level calculations. You know, so if it was blob tracking, so the FPGA could be looking for the color range drawing a rectangle around where the blob is, then taking just the video information of that blob, including its, you know, uh, origin, its XY point, just past a small amount of the frame 
over to the STM32 of interest that it's tracking. The STM32 then successively records the XY position to work out things like motion tracking, if something's moving, or the higher level um, algorithms. So that could still work in an SRAM situation because it's, you know, 32240. Hold on. 320 by 240. What is it? An 8 bit 422 YUV or is it RGB? How many bytes is that per pixel? In your um, default calculations. So 320 by 240 is 76k byte if it was 8 bit per pixel, but you might want more than 8 bit. Depends which color space you've got it in as well. You know, YUV, 8 bit might be fine, but if it's RGB, you're going to need 16 bit probably. So that would be 76 times 2, so you know, um, you're talking about 150k capture on a frame. That gets shrunken down if you're doing something like a blob tracking. So what gets sent up over QSPY to the um, STM32 is a very small portion of that. It's like a set of coordinates and then the uh, the smaller field of interest, rectangle of interest, successively. Okay, these are beyond the retro thing, but they are definitely in the range of the SRAM, uh, you know, 150K. Now, we probably want to circle back round to that and I may need to split this up slightly differently. But um, let's do that. Let's also do, just so that we don't forget that. Hmm, I wonder if I can do shift tab on here. Yeah, I can. Uh, oh. uh, other, not retro. data right this is a good seg segue and we can come back around to this this is why this is a good segue um, just switching over to the modern mezzanine for a sec uh, obviously we're talking about uh, hyper flash hyper round hyper flash I've already mentioned that um, on the mezzanine itself we have 25 pins uh, so that's 25 and on this on and that's all we have on the um, on the mezzanine and on the modern one unlike the retro where we're using a tile as well that where that goes up to 37 um, uh, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. 
So what that means is after using our hyperram and hyperflash, which is uh, let me think that was twelve pins. So the rest of the pins, which is 13, if we take the TX RX out of that, that's 11. Um, we were trying to think of what we would use these for. Uh, the conversation yesterday was centered around using it for doing the LCD display but the retro could also benefit from an LCD display and an LCD display even a parallel one could go on the tile because there are enough pins on the tile to do parallel so maybe the LCD display should be a tile. Then it can be used in either scenario, the modern mezzanine or the um, retro mezzanine scenario, because it's a tile. And I was thinking, well, what else could go on there? And one of the things that I talked about was the ESP32. So what we could do with those 13 pins is maybe keep the U on, take two off, we've got 11 left. Those 11 pins could go to the ESP32, as could the TX and RX. Why would I put 11 pins to the ESP32? Well, that enables me to be able to use the ESP32 and connect it up umbilically to the FPGA in any of the following modes. You are obviously, which we've got. SPI, quad SPI, octo SPI, or 8082. The ESPs also have a RGB LCD out, which could be done on those pins. And we could also do a camera in on that using those pins and all of those functions are available to us and they are selectable in the ESP32 uh, in software because they are those functions in the ESP32 say the S2 can be mapped to any of the GPIO pins within reason there's a few GPIO pins we can't use but as long as we use the IO pins that can accept any of the mucks from any of those functions which we can do then we have a interface between the ESP32 and the FPGA that could function in all of those different ways so it could work with the simple SPI code that I know Laurie already has the it could function maybe with a quad or octo spy which is a lot faster um, in those cases it would operate as a memory mapped interface come back round to that it could act as a 8080 interface like a parallel interface or a 68000 type interface it could also act as an LCD out why would that be useful well we may have an LCD tile that we talk to so in that case, the FPGA is just passing that through. Or in another case, even though we've got an LCD-like interface from the ESP point of view, it could actually output that to a VGA or a HDMI display. So it enables us to do you know, stuff from the ESP32 that appears on those displays. Or it goes the other way around. If we had a camera, then we could bring an image in over those pins um, using the uh, parallel camera in support. 
by mapping those pins in that way and having the correct HDL in the um, MICE 40. So that was my thinking about how we use those extra extra pins on the modern mezzanine, i.e. We, we add in an ESP32 module onto the mezzanine which can fit in. You know, the problem with not having connector space isn't an issue here because it's not taking any connector space really. It's just jutting out the front and providing all of those possible features. Not only that, but we can run micro Python or even circuit Python on it. And again, that's a really nice feature to have. Let me just catch up with the comments. Uh, more hyper RAM is another option. Uh, yeah, but it gets really expensive. Um, the one bit square PMOC can have four hyper RAM chips. Then you could run Linux. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to run Linux, but yeah. You could. You need, what, 32 meg for that. So you'd need four of the same hyper RAMs. And that's certainly possible. They are damn expensive at the moment, though. Um, I've got some. Probably are not many if we start doing, you know, four. Um... Yeah, and also um, Laurie's saying you could put an ESP32 and another SD card on the HR Mez. I could run more of the ULX3 code. Hello, SD code. Interface from the ESP. Well, you can do that, yeah. But I wouldn't add another SD card, really. I mean, if you go the S2 route, I don't think that has, um, does it have an SD card interface? Not all of them do, I know that. But what do you think on the ESP32, given, you know, if we allocate those 11 pins directly to the ESP32, plus the TX and RX, we can then run any of those interfaces we like Is that a good use of the pins? Seems a bit greedy, but that gives us an awful lot of flexibility and enables us to drag in both an Arduino interface because the ESP32 already has that. So you can write your code in, you know, Arduino if you're that way inclined. Um, or you can go MicroPython, CircuitPython route. What does thou think, folks? I like the ESP32 option, but 11 pins to the FPGA seems like a lot. It does seem slightly greedy. But that allows for all of those interfaces. Let me just read them out again. Obviously SPY, QSPY, OCTOSPY, which is the 8-bit SPY. Um, 80 and 802, sorry, 80, 80 and 8082, the RGB LCD interface, parallel 8-bit interface, and the um, parallel camera in. So you're allowing for all of those permutations. And it's nice and simple.
think I post must be busy somewhere. I'm just wondering actually can we do two things at once with the USB 32 could we do quad SBI no there'd be no point in mixing it with spy and the other ones are too big to allow quad SPI, so. Without an SD card on the ESP32, it has access to limited data. It does have the network and its own flash memory, but I don't know what I would want to send to and from ESP32 over all of those pins. That's a good point. I mean, one idea is you use it as a kind of micro Python deck and have it output to VGA and HDMI and those kind of things with all the real-time goodies that the FPGA provides. Plus you've got the power of the STM as well. So you prototype up in Python and then you start pushing functionality down into the STM32 and the um, FPGA as you optimize, i.e. as a kind of development platform all the way down. Um, does having the, you know, 11 IOs help you in that regard? I mean, you could capture directly from the uh, from the camera. You know, is it worth going beyond, say, quad SPI? I mean, the difference between quad SPI and the others is, you know, six pins. Uh, versus 11 pins and if you limited it to say that number of pins what would you do with the other five pins that you've got left over that's the other question so say you don't use the 11 pins you just use six and you only go up as far as QSBI, so you can do SPI and QSBI. What do you then do with the five pins that you have left that you haven't used on the mezzanine? What do you use those five pins for?
There must be other options for the five pins. I mean, the mast, but what? What are they? Right, have a little think. I'm just going to get a refill. Just going to mute back in a sec. Refreshments. How are we doing for time, guys? Nearly up to the one and a half hour mark. No, two and a half hours. One minute. What time did we start today? It was seven thirty, but we flaffed about, or I flaffed about. Not you, folks. Me, flaffed about restarting the stream getting the damn thing working um mm. uh, we've been going then about two hours i don't know we lost at least half an hour let's see there must be other options for the five pins audio connector is a possibility depends what you mean by audio connector are you talking about like a bit banged FPGIO to a jack? That simple kind of stuff. Um, buttons and LEDs, but a bit boring. Small SPI LCD display. Well, yes, you could do the small LCD display, but is it is that is that worth it? Or do we go for a better parallel one? I mean, I think you can have a better parallel one for a similar price. Um, I mean, just two pins for stereo order. Yeah, so that's direct bits. Um, yeah, you could do that. What's I2S? Is it? Oh, no, no, no. Yes. Isn't that... How many pins is I2S? Is it three or four? I can't remember now. But you could uh, you could do that. But then you can do that anyhow from the STM32. You don't need the extra FPGA pins to do that. I was just thinking if you were adding a codec like we do on the retro type thing. But you can do that from the STM32. You don't need to do that from the FPGA. So there's somewhat of a duplication going on. Real time clock. You've got a real time clock in the STM32, don't forget. Uh, Laurie. That's just a, that's just a bit of code. 
Um, because I also include the 32 kilohertz clock for the uh, real time clock functions on the STM32. I don't just put the fast crystal on, I put the um, low speed crystal on as well for the RTC. So we've already got that. But as you say, if we did use this for the, the extra pins, the whole nine yards, to use the Americanism, draw I post would love me for this, then um, yeah, what on earth, what on earth are we going to do? I mean, one thing you could do, is you could use it to bring video into the um, ESP32. from the FPGA. But, right, so here's my thinking of what's possible. Now, right now I don't think we can do a, like a Q-Spy between the Micro Python, for example, or Circuit Python and the FPGA. Because there is no quad supply, uh, quad, quad supply support. Not only that, how the event stuff would work, it's kind of tricky in MicroPython. It's not very responsive. Not kind of from a real timey point of view. So you wouldn't want to be doing anything real timey like that. However, if I was going to use QSPI on the ESP32, probably the best way of doing it. Um, is if you use ESPI2 on ESP32, you can put it in memory map mode. So if you put it in memory map mode, um, and then you write some HDL that looks like memory, but actually what that does is it talks to the hyper RAM or, or ROM, then your MicroPython slash circuit Python sees an extended memory map. So as well as, I mean, I'd probably use the um, N4 R4 R2, which has two megabytes of external memory, but it's on the module and uh, four megabytes. Oh, look who's here. We've got a friend and four megabytes of flash again on the module those are all in the memory map and, it, and python will use those as well as the internal sram which is about 500k or in fact it's about 320 if it was the s2 but then also in that memory map we could have the second spy using quad spi into the fpga and some hdl that fetches um any memory accesses, just like an SPI chip, flash chip would, for, from the hyper RAM. So we'd have a kind of NUMA like uh, architecture whereby the Python could read and write into, I mean, you could map it into the hyper flash in the FPGA, or you could map it into that 16K um just as a kind of temporary scratch pad area for exchanging information between the two things and because that works at a low level with c and micro python is just a a wrapper on top um there will be dma occurring underneath um at a low level um, so that might be the best way of making that work. I know it's not event based. It's not um, It's not like a custom protocol. It's a very um, a Very basic way of exchanging information. What you doing twinkle face? You want to say hello? Hmm? Say hello. You've been finishing all my, your suppers. Say hello to the folks. Hello. 
You're not in best mood, are you? You want to go back? Okay. Do I finish in your this? Um. Yeah, well, that's my thoughts. Uh, if we were to use something like Quad Spy between the SP32 and the um, FPGA, it would simply be a memory map to, you know, to whatever inside the uh, FPGA. It could be a memory map to all of it. It could memory map to, you know, the 16K inside, the Hyper Flash outside. Um, the 16k inside would be nice because it would be quite quick. Um, the hyper flash would be a bit slower, as would the hyper RAM, because the FPGA would have to have the read over quad SPI, convert that into a hyper flash access, get the data, and then return it back over the quad SPI. Um, it would be simpler if it's just accessing, you know, like a cached area in the 16k. Like a buffer area, um, so you could actually kind of do a primitive form of uh, DMA streaming like that, that didn't take too much uh, energy out of the uh, MicroPython. Possibly. Oh, iPod's popped out. I noticed. Are you still with me, Laurie? I know I'm burbling on about the um, Quad SPI and how that might work. Checking my messages, sorry folks. Um What do you think, Nori? Um, I think we should do the ESP32 and you decide how many pins it will use. It's one of those executive decisions. Yeah, I need to have a little bit of a think. Um, I mean, I can see the, you know, 11 pins, that's a lot. Do we really want to use that many? Seems wastage. But it's difficult to think what else can go on there. We should probably add a, a stammer as well. Um, I still think about it. Um, if there's a room. Uh, trouble is with the ESP32, it takes most of the frontier. 
don't know. We could have a vertical stemmer, maybe. You want to go out, of course. In the gardens. Mm. Not too cold tonight. It's only warm for February. Um, the main advantage of the ESP32 is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, but not sure how I'd use it. We did try Bluetooth keyboards connected via ESP32 on the ULX3. I, yeah, I don't know how well those would work. Might be it tends to be a bit of a delay with those sort of things. But yeah, possible. Um, now remind me if I want Bluetooth, Laurie. Uh, does the S2 have Bluetooth? Or is it just like an old Bluetooth or something? I can't remember. Or is it just Wi-Fi? Let me have a quick... Um, quick look. Uh, hmm. The reason I like the S2 is you can get a module that has the built-in 4 meg flash and 2 meg PS RAM, which is great for running the MicroPython stuff. I can't remember. Hold on. Can I run? Um, I'm just worried about crashing this damn thing. Well, if it does, it does. Given the problems earlier. Uh, what did I want? ESP data sheet. Can we turn this on? ESP32 data sheet. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget what the uh, functions are. It's a while since I looked at these ones. Uh, so the one that I'd use is the module that has this chip in it, which has PS RAM and flash. Um, the mini one, the ESP32 mini, that would be my go-to. So what does it say? Uh, Wi-Fi. Bluetooth. The S3 does, but we have no chance of getting hold of any of those, I'm afraid. They are like rocking horse doo-doo right now. We can get S2s, they're in stock. There's quite a few of those, the S2 module. Wi-Fi is more important than Bluetooth, but controlling robots over Bluetooth can be fun. Yeah, uh, the only other thing we could use would be the C3. If we use the C3, then that doesn't have any PS RAM. And, then, and you can't easily add it either. Um, so that would be a very limited addition from a um, if you wanted to run MicroPython for example you 
because you really need the external PS RAM if you're going to run that stuff. Particularly if you're going to do any networking stuff. Um, Yes. Compromises, compromises. And again, I'm not sure what availability is on C3s. I think you can get the modules. benefit of using an S2 like this is you could say you were using circuit Python then you'd get the um, the mass storage support built in uh, you'd have to expose the USB so you probably have to put a somehow put a USB connector on the mezzanine to take advantage of that I don't know I mean that's quite a nice quite a nice feature I mean, you saw the kind of stuff that you can do with that um, when I um, worked on the um, alloy prototype. You know, you could just drag an FPGA image on there. Um, you know, and the um, Python could recognize the name of that and say, oh, this is an FPGA image. It could then. Um, send it to the SDM32 which programs the FPGA which is kind of nice plus doing your Python on there is easy because you just literally you just have your Python file on that uh, storage so there are some user friendly elements to it which are interesting that's the S2. You wouldn't get that with the C3, I don't think, because there's no USB. However, it does have Bluetooth, right? S2 with a USB connector sounds good, said Laurie. USB gives extra options. It most certainly does. It gives us another UART as well, potentially. Mm. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Right, um, there was a thing about naming, let's quickly do that and then I think I'm going to call it for this stream. Um, so I think we're sold on the ESP. Um, and maybe ESP. S two 
mini uh, class. The stemmer connector, I can actually connect to that. So what I can do here is just, it's, it's best to connect to the, um, to this. There'll be enough pins for um, the stemmer. So the naming question I had, um, we were thinking of calling the board the carrier, and we've been using the term um, ice logic deck. I've been thinking about this more. So if we had a retro deck, what we're describing is the combination of pieces that make a retro deck, including the mezzanine and its tiles. Likewise, with the modern thing, we may have a robotics deck, right? Um, you know, and that may have some motor drivers, a camera. It might have one or the other of the mezzanines, etc., etc. So the result is the deck, it's the combination of things. Rather than the carrier being called the deck. And maybe we should call the carrier uh, the ice logic bench. Right, the thing on which the tiles go to make the deck. Don't know what you think about that, but it was a naming thing. Um, it's not really just the naming of the board, but the conce conceptually, the deck is made up by the component parts. That's the deck. <clears throat> That's just what I was. That was what was going through my mind mentally. So that when we come to present this, you know, to newcomers, the uh, you know the story that we're telling, the narrative makes makes sense in terms of functionality and wording and things. What do you reckon, Lloyd? I would ask iPost as well, but he's um, he's busy doing something. He's popped out. And I don't know what everyone else is doing at this point. I missed a bit of that. Um, so what I'm saying is currently I have the Ice Logic deck. That's the carrier name. And I'm thinking, well, actually, the deck is the combined bunch of bits put together. That is what the deck is. It's the output. That's the result. So if you have a retro deck that consists of the, you know, the SRAM mezzanine with a bunch of tiles like game controllers, uh, you know, it, VGA tile, etc. That is the deck, the finished thing. Uh, likewise with the modern device or the, a robotic deck you know it's a combination of one mezzanine and some other bits so the deck terminology talks about the solution i.e., the combination of different things therefore the carrier wouldn't be called a deck so what about calling the baseboard um, ice logic bench i.e. the bench being the thing that you build it on I know it's a change late, but it, I'm just thinking about the wording and the way that it looks and it kind of suddenly that just wasn't making sense to me with the existing naming. You know, the deck is the solution. You know, it's the, the parts combined. Not an individual part of it. So it's just a naming thing. Right, um, unless you've got any further questions, I'm going to call it for the stream.
and um, we might do something on Friday possibly see how it goes I see Laurie's typing there may be another question yet huh. no he's just typing no more questions <laughs> right folks thank you for your time thank you for sharing it with me uh, if you're seeing this recording thank you for watching and uh, do join one of our live ones do join us down on discord if you can because uh, we talk about all this stuff in between and as well so if you want to get more of it uh, but in the meantime you know just thanks for joining me and uh, ciao <laughs>